Good morning, and welcome to Making Sense of It. This program is our gift to you from the Glasser Institute for Choice Theory. I am Mona Duncan, your moderator, and each week we have someone from the Glasser Institute to present a concept and how they use it in their life and to help us understand it better and uh, produce some amazing results. Anyway, today uh, I didn't have a anyone scheduled, so I went back to a video that had been filmed by Dr. Glasser and to have a small portion of this to show you. Um, it was filmed by Jim Roy, was the photographer, the, the kid video person, and Brian Lemon and Linda Harshman were the ones asking him questions. It was filmed in um, the international meeting in Canada in 2004. And in this particular segment, Dr. Glasser is talking. He has just finished talking about his influence of his mother, which you can look on the recordings from before. And now he is talking about his father's influence on him and some mentors that were both agreed with him and some that disagreed with him. And then a personal encounter that he had with a young boy who had asthma. So let me share the screen and we'll let Dr. Glasser take us away. My father, I mean, well, if we had a let's compare our fathers, I could, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a word about my dad. I mean, he, he was very, very important to me. And just, you know, he, he lived to a good, long lived life. And finally, he, he kind of, lost track of things, not Alzheimer's disease, but kind of like that, just old age dementia, I called it. And the last two years, he wasn't able to, he was in a, in a, in a place where they took care of him. And, and he was okay in there. But he was 89 and you, know, you can't complain about that. Yeah, a lot of positive memories of her. I mean, uh, you know, she took me places and showed me things. I re she, she was a very intuitive psychologist. When I was around 11 year, 10 or 11 years of age, my father would go to Chicago on business and my mother would say, let's go with him. And we stay at the Edgewater Beach Hotel, which is a very nice hotel. And we would and we would hang out in Chicago. They had museums and other things. And my mother took me to visit the stockyards in Chicago. That was a big deal. I think Upton Sinclair wrote a book about the stockyards there. St. Clair, one of those guys wrote an important book. And we went into the part where they were slaughtering the hogs, like, you know, uh, Al, that poet, Chicago, hog butcher to the world and all that. He, I can't think of his name, but he's a poet that, a very popular poet. And when we went in there, there was two roads through it. One walk, you didn't see the hogs killed. And the other way, you'd see them killed, and then they would join paths, the people that didn't. And there was about 40 people in our group. And my mother said to me, now see this and learn from this. You see these 40 people, every one of them is going to go see the hogs killed. Not one of them is going to take the alternate path. And she was absolutely right. And she explained to me, because people are kind of bloodthirsty and they like to see that kind of a thing. It wasn't, you know, it was just teaching, you know, learning about people. And, and, and not, not many children have a mother that teaches them kind of the lessons of life. Lessons that she really didn't learn well himself, herself, but she could she could teach them to others. And, and so uh, uh, we'd go to museums and she'd go to the library and encourage me to read. And 
didn't have to encourage me. I mean, I was an addicted reader, but as soon as I learned to read it, all I did was read, 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 read. But uh, nevertheless, she would like to go to the movies about Africa, Frank Buck, and bring them back alive, and, and all these kinds of things. And she loved the circus. She would always make sure we went to the circus. And she just loved the Ringing Brothers Circus. And, and, and she would point out, in those days, they didn't have the net underneath the trapeze artists. They could fall and they could hurt themselves. They had people to catch them, but that's not so good. And she'd explain again, see, that's how they are. They want to, that's, that's, the people want to see them risking their lives up there. And she thought, you know, that's again, demonstrating me about people and teaching me about people. And so, no, I, I, to me, she was a good mother. To the world, she wasn't such a very good person because she'd fight with everybody and everything. And she treated my father pretty crudely also at times. And they had their big arguments and they lived through it. But they hung together for 60 some years. So when I became a psychiatrist and all, all I've ever done is counseling or psychotherapy or whatever you want to call it, talking to a person about the things that I talk to them about and they talk to me about. I've never been, uh, well, I've, I've put it this way. I've always been amazed at, at how people can talk at length about their parents as if they expected their parents to be more than they are. And I never expected, my parents were good parents. As I said, my mother was good to me. But I don't think anybody, as I've lived my life, and I've, you know, I've had good friends, and I've had marriages, and I have my children. But the idea that one person has such an effect upon another person, I read about it in books, and Freud talked about it and everything else, it's never affected me that way. It's it, it just that, you know, and my mother used to say this to me. And this was a, uh, one of her thousands of sayings. She had thousands of sayings. She said, remember Billy, she called me, the King of England puts on his pants the same as you do. <laughs> and that was her, her, her saying, you know, that in a certain sense, you're just as good as he is. And, and, and I don't care if he's king or anyone, nobody puts his pants on for him. He pulls them on himself, just like you do. And, and so, uh, but I accept it. But I've always, in my counseling, I've drifted in the direction of saying, it's your life. Not that you're selfish, not that you want a bad life for other people, which I certainly never do, but that uh, if you spend your life wishing for better relationships than you have or expecting more from this person or that person, you're going to go through your life, you know, like Miniver Chibi, that poem, you know, always disappointed. And, and, I, and, I, and my father used to teach me that too. My father who was not a, uh, he was, was not a, a, a real slick guy. He wasn't that way at all. He had the reputation in Cleveland, Ohio, though. He did have a little reputation. What was my father's reputation? He had a business where he had to make a lot of fine notations on things. My father had the best pencil points in Cleveland. He would work on that pencil, that long lead and, and taper it down with his little knife, and then he'd wear those steel guards over it so it wouldn't get broken. And, and, and that, was, that was his thing. And he could also curl cigar wrappers. He likes to smoke one cigar a day, couldn't smoke in the house. My mother wouldn't let him, which was a reasonably good thing because cigars stink as far as I'm concerned. But, but that was okay. He would, he would smoke it to a certain place and he'd chew on it for the rest and then throw it away. <laughs> and then he, he had a way of dealing with those cellophane wrappers they came in to make a long thing out of them that no one could ever make except him. And so he had certain skills, there's no doubt about that. And then I would try it, he'd, he'd try to help me, but I, I couldn't do it. My father could also fix things. And I, that's how I became interested. And my father, he taught me an important lesson in life. I worked in his office as a 
summer helper. The children all tried to turns at that. My cousins did it too. And, and he would send a lot of small packages out. In his business, the watch business, the packages were all very small. And I would pack them up real quick, but sloppy. And my dad came in and he said, look, if you don't want to pack them neatly, then don't pack them at all. Not going to yell at you, never criticize you, nothing like that. But let me show you how to pack a package. And he could pack it beautifully. I still can't pack a package as well as him or as well as Carlene. These people have a knack for really doing things with their hands that, that I can't do. But I can, if I try, pack a reasonably good package. And that's just a little lesson that he taught me. Never angry, never criticizing. But he say, when people look at the package and they see the Merit Company, that was the name of his business, built on merit, that was his motto. And uh, <clears throat> where that came from, I had no idea. But anyway, uh, the thing was, he said, people will judge my company when they receive that package. I mean, so it's just like dressing well or whatever. And my father always dressed well. He always wore a suit and a tie and everything like that uh, when he went to work. And he, he ate dinner with a bunch of men at a big round table in a nice restaurant. We didn't have to reservation. The table was big enough. Whoever came, they could squeeze over. I think they could see 16 or 17 men around the table. And I would eat with them when I was downtown at times. And felt very welcome at the table. My dad was very respected and very welcome. And some of those guys were, were very smart guys. And, uh, and uh, I listened to everything they had to say when they'd have conversations. And you know, I was young, you know, 15, 16, 17 years of age. And it's just that, you know, I remember that. My, my father liked to take, he didn't like to drive downtown. He could take the streetcar down because he could read his newspaper, get off right at his office. And then quite frequently, even my mother who drove the car, she's one of the few women that really drove a lot. In those years, she would drive downtown and sometimes take with me, pick up my father. We'd eat in a cafeteria downtown. And those were very, very pleasant times. And, and, uh, we talked about how thinly they could slice the roast beef in the cafeteria and still get it sliced and things like that. But uh, this, uh, well, life, and I had, and I had also, uh, I had a big fantasy life when I was a kid. And I remember it. I remember my dog. My dog was a toy dog that I had for years. In fact, I lost it recently. I don't know where it went to. I had it for many years. The dog was called Bozo. And uh, and the motto that I made up the dog with Bozo butts drives you nuts. And I don't know, but anyway, I'd always sleep with Bozo, and then Bozo and I would have adventures and and all kinds of things we would do together. Nothing harmful, but it's like a magical kind of a fantasy life, which which I uh, which I enjoyed. I never talked to anyone much about it. I tell my parents a little bit about it, but it wasn't anything that would interest them particularly. But I enjoyed going to bed and and then then in the middle of my fantasy I end up asleep and 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 I still I still think before I go to sleep. But it's when I do a lot of thinking now and I do a lot of thinking the first thing in the morning when I get up, I see my creativity is really really very sharp then and and ideas just come to me and i've learned to be receptive to ideas and not to put myself or my ideas down and and uh so and carlene and naomi both noticed and say well you're off in it aren't you and and i'd say yeah, i guess i am i start getting off and and not paying attention to much of anything because i'm really involved in thinking about something Carly used to say, what are you thinking about? I said, it really helps me if you don't ask me that question right in the middle. And she understood it. But but sometimes she asks, and I tell her what I'm thinking too. I think some kind of at the end of a thought or something like that. But using my mind to just enjoy my own mind, I find it to be very enjoyable uh, to think about things. And I spend a tremendous amount of time thinking about choice theory. Just recently, 
I wrote in our newsletter something about self-evaluation, and it was something new that I never thought about, and I did it today in the talk, and I didn't tell the people I was doing it, but actually in the role plays, I did what I talked about. I evaluated myself for am I sticking to the choice or am I deviating from it? And I found if I really stuck to it, I was able to do some really great role plays today that seemed to be quite difficult, but turned out not to be that difficult because I was continuing evaluating now. You talk about the importance of relationships. You talk about the importance of not, you know, criticizing and complaining and blaming. And, and, and are you sticking to that with this client? Because the way you're going to reach this client, because there were people played some really dysfunctional people. And, and the kind of person that maybe you'd wonder, well, what do you do? What do you say next with these people? But if I stick to the basic choice theory, I can figure out what to say next. And, and it really did work well. I think something you want to be realized that there comes from the board for person to have a very definite style of your own. I, I thought about that in the beginning when I, when I met Dr. Harrington and I asked him. I said to him, uh, a lot of the stuff that we're taught doesn't really mean much. What means much is can we make friends, I used to call it, make friends with the client and talk about what's going on in their life now, not in the past, not in the future, but it's now. And Dr. Harrington, who I hardly knew, but I felt he was someone I could talk to. I had met him only a few months before, and he reached across and he said, okay, join the club. That's how he had been thinking. But he wouldn't push that off on the residents unless they came up with some. And he got enough involved with me that he stuck with me and probably would have stuck with me longer. But I think uh, I was getting more and more prominent. And his wife was kind of unhappy that she thought he taught me everything. He didn't teach me everything, but he taught me a lot. And there was no way. I asked him, would you write a chapter for the book Reality Therapy, which he did, and it was a good chapter. I mention him always and all the times I mention, but uh, uh, I, I could tell it became uncomfortable for him, and uh, it may have been his wife, maybe not, but I thought it was, and because she was very friendly at first, and then she became a little bit cool when we would meet after that, and so that's... Uh, not so much I learned as he supported what I said <laughs> and, and I felt it was then worth doing that, uh -huh. the, the, the problem um, is always yes. now it's always with an important person in the person's life or maybe they have no one at all but usually they have someone they're not getting along with and that <clears throat> that you just try as best as you can to teach them to make literally better choices, although we didn't use the word choices very much. And by the time I got to choice theory, Harrington had already passed away. So I, I, but by that time, I wasn't seeing him very much or talking to him very much. But when everyone in the world is teaching, you got to go back in the history. You got to, oh, and the transference. There's something that they still talk about as they teach counseling that the client transfers onto you uh, the feelings that he may have had for his father, his mother, his child, or something like that. And that's a big part of psychoanalysis, what they call analyzing the transference and analyzing the counter transference. And, and I say, I don't even think the transference exists. I think that Freud's, you know, he struggled with that because people did have strong feelings for him, which was tough on him. It's tough on any, any counselor, but that it's not transference. They really do feel for you. And then that's what happens. And, and, and Harrington said, yes, that's, that's, that's what I believe too. I mean, you know, 50 years later, 
it doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you're starting out and you're booking the train to the high grade psychiatric department and telling them that you don't believe in some of the things that they're teaching, it was, uh, you know, I, I mean, I lost ground because of that. They would never refer me any patients after I left the psychiatric program. But I worked so cheap, I could get patients from the psychiatric clinic, which was $10 an hour. I told the women, but the women respected me because my patients made a lot of progress. I said, send them to me so you can see a real psychiatrist in an office for 10 bucks an hour. I even saw some for five bucks an hour. I never charged big money, but uh, that's what got me started. Some of these patients found other patients and led to other patients. And, of course, the best referral sources in counseling is from your patients themselves. And, and then I had pretty good, pretty good referral through them. And then, of course, I worked in the schools and moved a lot into that so that even today, schoolwork is at least half the time of my efforts in terms of lecturing and writing and things like that. You took a stand against traditional psychiatry and psychotherapy. Was there a price for that? Against well, the price was that at the last, because I was so successful in my counseling, which they knew, with difficult people. In fact, what you do when you're a resident counselor at UCLA back in 1953, when I was did my last year there at UCLA, what you get are a bunch of patients who've been coming to the clinic for years, which are now transferred to you. No one expects you to really make any progress with them. And I discharged them all very quickly and, and got them going and discharged them and they were happy to leave and, and things like that. And I also had some very, uh, you know, I had a little kid with asthma. I didn't usually see children, but his mother brought him in and he had really asthmatic attacks. He was having them in school and all kinds of things. And, and I said to myself, he's causing his own asthma attacks. He's having them to control his mother, and he's having them to control his teachers. And But he was an athletic little kid, and I'm not that athletic, but with a 10-year-old, I'm moderately athletic. And he liked to play basketball. And at the UCLA, we had a place where we could play basketball with kids. And, you know, I could beat him, you know. <laughs> and when he started to lose, he'd come up with an asthmatic attack. And I'd say, no, you got to keep playing. I, I, mean, I, I mean, he said, well, I, you know, I could die from it. I said, you're not going to die from it. And, and, and I said, and you're not going to win the game because you have an asthmatic attack. And if I'm bigger and better than you, I am bigger and better than you. Are. But he got pretty good. And, and so at that point, he said to his mother, and he complained to his mother. And he said, Dr. Glasser, he won't stop playing when I'm having my asthma attack. And his mother came in to see me. And, and, and she said, is that true? I said, yes, that's true. Well, why do you do it? Because if he can curl the world with asthmatic attacks, he's never going to get rid of his asthma. It's going to get to be a pattern and he'll have it for the rest of his life. And don't you think he can curl? Yes, she says, I think he does. Well, I don't suggest you do it. You're his mother, and that would be traumatic. Let me do it. And, and then everything changed. He stopped the asthma in school. He stopped with his mother. He got good grades on his report card. It was a tremendous recovery from what was a real difficult person. And really, I was using some choice theory aspects at that point. The, the idea of controlling you with symptoms, which is a choice theory idea. And uh, I'm not saying it's not. I thought of it first, but I really began to think of ways to deal with it. That, it. that it's not just something you make an interpretation to, that you get insight into. It's something in how you actually behave with the client themselves to show them that you will live what you believe. And then you become very important. And that kid worshipped me at the end. I mean, he absolutely worshipped me. It was just amazing uh, because he realized in a certain sense, he realized, and I explained it to him to some extent, 
I've helped you to get over this attack, and, and that's good for you. And yes, he says, I understand it. I understand it exactly. I'm sure he's quite a success in life. I never followed anyone, but, but he learned something. And then I got the feeling that I still have, and maybe talking about more now than then, that the job of the counselor is to do more than counsel, it's to teach. And I really think, in fact, I think the Greek translation of counseling has something to do with teaching or something like that. And, and so I had these experiences. I had experiences in the mental hospital. Why I don't believe in schizophrenia. Happened to me, I was three months of psychiatric residency with 54 patients. And I didn't know much about it. And one of the good things about being a psychiatric residence in the veterans hospital, they okay. don't bother you. you want to stop sharing. You're there. But I think they let you be. There's a doctor ahead of the building, but he doesn't come after you and check into you. You come to him, he'll counsel you. Otherwise, learn. And that was a very good okay. way. Let me see if and I so can maybe I have I have to patient. share it again so I can stop uh, I didn't. I was a, I was scared of this patient. He was a big guy. These were veterans. And there it is. Okay. Well. That was very interesting. I'm sure that you really enjoyed hearing from Dr. Glasser himself. Um, and thank you for joining us today. And we'll go ahead and close the airways out. And those of you that are here live, we can have some dialogue with one another. And those of you that are watching, well, join us live the next time. In the meantime, have good mental health, a great day, and good mental health. Blessings. <laughs>